Why don't we Why don't we stand together as we um, as we hear the word this morning? Because you know I've been praying for you this week, and uh, just believing that maybe you can sense it this morning as well in the atmosphere and just as you come in that God's doing something great in our church, and I'm uh, just getting a sense there's great faith in the room, and uh, I've been praying for you this week just that God would give you something that you haven't got right now, that God would fill you with the Holy Spirit afresh, that He would break out in your life so that you can be and make an impact in your world. So if you have faith for that, if you've come hungry this morning, I'll just invite you just to raise your hands and just to get ready for what God wants to do this morning. God, I thank You that You are doing something new in our church. Lord, that You are pouring out Your Spirit, filling us afresh, a fresh move. Lord, transform us from the inside out. Lord, that we would not just take it for ourselves, but that we would go, impact our world, impact our schools, impact our workplaces, our families, that we would see glory come to you. Many come to know you because of what you are doing in our life. So Lord, speak to us today. Lord, we hunger and thirst for more of you. Lord, that you would reawaken us to yourself. Lord, that we would lean in, that we would Grab hold of all that you have. Increase our faith in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Why don't we put our hands together? Hey, you can grab your seats. Preparing uh, for this message this week, I was uh, sitting on my laptop in my house and my daughter, Aria, my three and a half year old, comes over and, and, and she's like, what are you doing, Daddy? And I said, I'm writing my sermon. I'm preaching this week. And she's like, I want to write a sermon. And, um, and I'm like, you want to be a preacher? She's like, yeah, I want to be a preacher. I want to be a preacher, a doctor, because my wife's a doctor, and a drummer. Yeah. What a powerful combination. And, um, and I'm like, love, what do, you, what do you want to preach about? And, and she's like, David and the lion's den. Yeah. And I'm like, well, if you're going to preach about that, make sure it's, you're preaching about Daniel, not about David, for a start. <laughs> Who's been teaching you this stuff? And... Um, and I'm like, well, you got, you know, you got to have something. What's the message? What's your message? What are you wanting to preach? And she's like, I want to preach. I'll preach about Jesus. And I'm like, oh, you can't go wrong. Just preach Jesus. That's powerful. But I did say you probably need to work on that. You can't just say Jesus. You got to be a bit more prepared. And so, um, but she's, you know, she'll be a preacher one day, I believe. And uh, and she loves it. And well, this morning, um, my message is called Open Hands. Trusting hearts, open hands, trusting hearts. Where we talk, unpacking, looking at uh, God's provision in our life, how we can trust God's provision in our life. And um, who wants to see more of God's provision in their life? Does anyone want to see that? I'll tell you, I'm like, I could do with more provision. I need God's provision. And uh, so we're looking, we're looking at that. And we're going to be looking at straight up how. God's provision often comes in unexpected packages. It does. God's provision often comes in ways that we're not expecting. And, um, and so I'm gonna, we're going to be looking at the story of where Jesus, God feeds the 5,000. We're going to be looking at that story in Matthew 14. But before we dig into that, I want to share a story of God's miraculous provision in my life. A funny story is um, from my student days. Um, has it, can anyone recall a time where you, we were really poor, where you just had very little. And uh, I, had, I had a few years like that. I was a student. Are there any students here? There's probably a few students. And I'm like, God bless you. So I was, I was a student studying education, and I had no job. I, I really, I had nothing. This particular week, I had a whole week, I think it was a five-day period, where I checked my bank account, and there was like three zeros. It was zero, like a kid you know, it was, there was actually nothing in my bank account. And I didn't have food at home. And uh, yeah, that's right. You should feel sorry for me. <laughs> I was destitute. And, and I, had, I was in the position, right, which didn't happen all the time, but there was unexpected things that happened financially, bills and things that happened, you know, amen. Um, and, and so I, had, I, was, I looked at my week ahead. I'm like, I do not know how I'm going to eat this week. And, um, and, and so here's the thing, right? I did what any good Christian would do, and I'm like, what am I going to do if I've got no food? I'm going to set aside at least two days for prayer and fasting. <laughs> and, 
If I've got no food, I may as well fast. And, uh, and so, so I actually did. I did an extended fast. Um, and, and, but I was, I was hungry. And, but I prayed. And I'm like, but I'll tell you what, there's times, it's actually funny that there's times when we have, when we have little, our faith can actually be at its greatest. Have you found that in your own life? That when you're actually pressed or you're pressured and, and you're under pressure, actually that's the time when, when your faith actually has an opportunity to grow and to trust in God. And so, so that's what I did. I wasn't stressed. I'm just like, well, God, you know, you said um, Matthew 6, you talked about don't worry about your life, what you'll eat. And I'm like, that's me. I'm not worrying about what I'm going to eat because God will provide. And, um, and uh, so a couple of days went by and he didn't. And, uh, but then I went, I went to uni one day and I'm just, I'm like, man, I'd love some food. And, and on the way out of uni, I kid you not, there was, as I was about to um, head out and then catch the bus back home, there was a guy um, standing uh, in, the, in the university yard and he, and he came up to me and he said, hey man, we've been, we've been selling some pizza today, it's the end of the day, I would you take some pizza with you? And he put three boxes of pizza in my arms and I'm like, there is a God! <laughs> and, and you know, it's a funny story, but it's funny, how, it's funny how God does provide when we need it. And he often do it in unexpected ways. You know, I couldn't have scripted that. When I was praying to him about my need, I didn't know what he was gonna do. And uh, I think God also has a sense of humour with how he answers our prayers. And so that, I've had God provide for me so much throughout my life. And just to actually spend some time this week in preparation for the message, actually doing a mental list over the course of my life, God, you have provided for me in this way. And actually thinking, man, there are like dozens of supernatural, crazy, unexpected ways that God has provided for me over my life. And I tell you, it does something to your spirit when you actually make a mental checklist like that. But God's provision often comes in unexpected passages. I've only got a short time today, so I've got to move through quickly. Let's have it, open up our story uh, in Matthew 14 and, uh, and read about um, this, this multiplication miracle. When Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. You know, right at the outset, I love this, that Jesus saw the need. Jesus saw. Jesus perceived and then he also met the need. I just love that. Isn't that good news? Isn't that good news today that God knows what you need? It's so simple, but if we get this on a profound level, it will change your life. When you actually know that, hey, God knows what I need, because I think cognitively or intellectually, I'm like, yeah, God knows everything. God knows what I need. But not just that God knows the need, but he wants to do something about the need. And so we read this here. We read, and Jesus is the perfect embodiment, the representation of the Father. So this is like what Jesus, this is what God is all about, that he sees the need and he wants to do something about the need. He saw the large crowd and he had compassion upon them and healed their sick. Do you know that Jesus is highly tuned to your every need? Highly tuned, highly observant of what was, what's going on in your life. Man, it's good to hear that. He knows everything that you're going through right now. Every stress, every worry, every situation, he knows it. You know, I wonder, I just love this passage in Matthew 6, which says, For he knows what you need before you ask. He knows what you need before you ask. Isn't that good to remember? That he already knows it, even before we know it. And um, I'm, I'm often like this with my wife, and, uh, and I just intuitively just know what she needs. You know, <laughs> when... when <laughs> When she, when she starts snapping at me, when she's a little bit grumpy with me, I, I've got, I know exactly what to do. I get a chocolate, I, get, I make a cup of coffee, and I say, honey, 
Here you go, love. I just want to bless you. <laughs> Guys, it's coffee or chocolate. That's all you need. That's the answer. And, and so I'll just, I'll see it and I'll give it to her and just present it to her. And I'll say, here you go, honey. And she's like, how did you know? <laughs> and, then, and then she just starts singing to me. She says, you know just what I need before I say your word. You're a good, good husband. It's who you are. And she just sings over me. And she just serenades me with thanksgiving. And <laughs> but you know, but you know, God is like that with us, that He, before we even are aware of our needs, He actually knows. He can observe it. And He knows it. And He's looking for ways to provide for us even before we've asked. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that good to know? So Jesus sees the need. And then it says in the next passage, as evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, hey, Jesus, this is a remote place and it's getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to villages and buy themselves some food. Hey, Jesus, these people are hungry. I just wanted to bring this to your attention. And then Jesus is like, Oh, well, you, you thought that I didn't know. You thought, oh, you're, thank you, disciples, for telling me this. Thank you for bringing me this news. And, uh, and I think, you know, Jesus had already observed the need. We've seen that. Jesus was highly attuned to what was going on around him. He, he knew that people were hungry. And, and I think that there's a lesson in that for us is that sometimes we, we think we're bringing things to God. But in fact, we actually need to acknowledge that he already knows. He already knows. And I love that. So there's an interplay between the disciples and Jesus is a key point of this passage. And um, so they bring this need to Jesus. And then, you know, they say, there's a problem. There's a problem, there's no food. And I think we see in this passage ourselves in this. And that we can often be like the disciples and we can see the problem. We can see the problem. We're good at seeing the problem and then maybe praying about the problem. But, you know, Jesus, he didn't see a problem. He saw an opportunity to provide. He actually saw the situation in a completely different way. He didn't see a problem. He saw an op opportunity for God's generous provision. And one of my favorite devotional authors um, who's titled a couple of great devotional books that are hard to get a hold of, but called Victorious Mindsets, and um, let's just laugh at that, a guy called Steve Backland um, out of the United States. And he talks about this thing that, in fact, our problems aren't our greatest concern. Our problems are not um, our greatest problem. Our thinking about the problem is actually a bigger problem. It's actually the thinking about what's going on where there is issues and cracks and flaws. And so we see this in the disciples actually seeing the problem and they're not seeing the problem the way they should be seeing it. And often we can be like that, isn't it? We can be, there can be beliefs behind our unbelief. So when we have doubts, it's not just that we don't have any belief. We're just believing in the wrong things, or we have the wrong belief. So when we, when we start to get anxious or worried about things, what we actually need to get better at doing is evaluating the thoughts and the beliefs that we're having. We actually need to be better at evaluating, because behind those anxious thoughts... Behind the stress, there's actually underlying beliefs, which might say something like this. God, this problem is too big for you to find a solution for. And when you actually evaluate it, what the underlying belief is, it just seems ridiculous. It doesn't actually line up with what we say we believe. Or, God, there is no possible solution in this situation that will be positive. And actually behind our worry, behind our stress, behind the problem, there's actually a greater problem, which is the wrong beliefs. And God's wanting to deal with those wrong beliefs to actually say, evaluate that and then replace those mistruths with God's promises. And actually, when you capture it, you think, actually, I know that that seems ridiculous, that God can provide 
all my needs. In fact, in Philippians it said, my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches. That he knows what I need before I ask. That our God is big, our God is great. There is nothing too big for him. And when we actually realise the wrong thinking, we can actually replace it with God's truth and start to believe differently about the problem. Often the problem's not the problem, it's our thinking about the problem that is the problem. You know, part of the thinking around that when the disciples came to Jesus, part of the wrong thinking was that they had assumed some things about Jesus. They had assumed some things about Jesus that, Jesus, you know, you're interested in the preaching, but you're not interested in providing for the practical need. You know, you're into the healing, but you're not wanting to, you're not really that interested in addressing the hunger. And they had this kind of like dualistic thinking about what Jesus was on all about. And Jesus is thinking, I'm actually about much more than just preaching and healing. I'm much more about that. I'm actually wanting to come and reveal to you. I want you disciples to know that I'm interested in all of your life. I'm interested in the spiritual, the things that you think are spiritual. I'm interested in what happens on a Sunday. I'm, ha- I'm just as interested about what happens on a Monday as all what happens in here on a Sunday. I'm just as much interested in about what you're doing in your devotional life as in the conversations um, that you're having as you're paying the bills at home. Or Jesus is saying, he's wanting the disciples to know, actually, I'm fully integrated. I want to be involved with every part of life. And the gospel, the good news, Jesus, I am, I'm a God who is interested in all areas of your life. Isn't that good to know? That everything is spiritual to God. Everything matters to Him. And that was the, the thinking, the wrong believing behind what the disciples um, saw as a problem. He cares. You know, we see this. Jesus replied, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. I love that. I just like to pretend how Jesus was saying it. And I have no idea how he said it. But he said, you give them something to eat. And then they brought brought the loaves and the fish to him. And the disciples and the interaction with Jesus is the focus of this story. Hence why they only give us a little bit of information about the loaves and the fishes. The fish, but we see um, in in Luke and in John's account is that it was a little boy who was brought before Jesus who presented, handed his um, food to Jesus. He handed his food to Jesus, and I, I was just thinking about that, and just thinking it sound in hindsight, it's such a nice story. It's so I'm like, oh, good on you, little boy. You did a, you're a hero. But then I was thinking about his family members and what they were thinking. You know, he wasn't there on his own. He was with his family. And I was thinking of the family like, hey, what are you doing? You're giving away our food. You're a crazy man. And they were unhappy with him. They, they would have, to get behind that, I'm thinking, you know, there's also people around, as Jesus is calling out and said, does anyone have anything that they're happy to give? Think about all the people that would have had something. There would have been many, many people who had something. But it was only the one boy who handed it with open hands. And I I just think, man, I can identify with that. If I'm out in the middle of nowhere and I've got my family there, it's like the food is for them. Like that, that's, um, it's not a bad thing. And I can fully identify with that. And so I wouldn't blame them. But what I want to say today is that sometimes the most generous stewardship of what you have can seem completely irresponsible. I want to spend some time on this because this is, this is challenging. This is controversial. Generous stewardship can seem irresponsible. And you know, sometimes when God calls us to give what we don't think we can give, and you think, yeah, that was great. The boy just gave it off. But there was a moment in time where the boy had nothing. Think about that. There was a moment in time where he gave it where he was empty handed. And I'm like, so much, we actually like to obey God in a different way, don't we? 
which is not bad, but we are, often we're limited to thinking, you know, I'll, I'll give God out of the overflow. When I'm, when I'm feeling full, when I feel like I've got plenty, then I'll give. Then I'll be generous. Then I'll give of my time. Then I'll catch up with that person. When in fact, the challenging thing about the gospel, the challenging thing about the, the call to follow Jesus is that Jesus asked for his little when it left him with nothing. Isn't that challenging? You know, sometimes we think, oh, you know, God just wants to, for us to be comfortable. God just wants to ha- for us to have so much at all times. Do you know that is not true? Because at the times when we have the most, often that's when we trust God the least. Not always the case, but God knows this. And so he's, not, he's a God and a Father who wants to provide. He wants us to, be, to provide for us because he's a good Father, but he's also a God who's interested in our souls who wants us to trust him. So he wants to provide, but he wants us to trust him. And he knows that sometimes when we have all that we need all the time, we're not going to trust him. So he's wanting those two things for us. And he called uh, for that boy to give everything he had, leaving him for a, a moment and some moments in time to have nothing. Why? There was a point there that he had to trust God. Even though I'm empty, I trust you, God. I don't know if you've ever had a time where you feel, you've felt empty and, and that God, there's been like demands for your time or demands for your need. And you just think, it's so easy in that moment to say, nope, I don't have enough to give. Which is to say, really, the belief behind that is, no, I don't I just have enough to give at the moment, but I don't believe that God can supply my needs. I don't believe that God is aware that I'm on empty and that he wants to fill me. I wonder, I wonder that we don't see God's miraculous provision in our lives because we're actually too busy worrying about ourselves and about what we have, as long as we've got enough, as long as I've got enough. And then I'll give a little bit. You know, he gave his whole lunch, he didn't give his leftovers. He didn't, he didn't give, he didn't eat it and think, oh, I've got enough, and then give the crumbs. He gave the complete lunch. And you know, God's calling for your best, your very best, your very all, your best and not your rest. And man, man that's challenging, because there's times where that hurts. There's time when it sucks to be empty and, and for God to actually tap his finger on your shoulder and say, Sam, I want you to, I want you to do that for that person. And you think, God, oh, I don't have anything to give. I don't have anything to give. But you know, God's saying, would you trust me? Would you trust me? As you see the need, as you provide for the need, as you give it to me, would you trust me? You know, <clears throat> one time in my life. Uh, again, I was a student, a poor student, and God spoke to me about sponsoring a, a sponsor child, uh, an international child. And I didn't have much money at the time, but, um, but I had enough for the $300 to pay for the 12 months. And, and so I'm just like, I'm just going to be, you know, even though I don't have much, I'm going to be obedient. And, and so I signed up, I, I, the payment went off with absolutely no, n- no idea about how I was going to the 12 months ahead, you know. Young people don't plan ahead anyway. So, um, so there I did. So the, but 12 months later, I didn't have a job. I had no money in the bank account. Again, this is a bit of a theme, isn't it, in my life? <laughs> but I really, I'd made a commitment and I felt in God that it was the right thing to do. And so I'm like, God, I, I literally can't pay for this beautiful sponsor child. Help, help me. And I was in the process of looking at um, applying for jobs. I've been doing that for some time. But I just think, you know, this is, I wasn't thinking about myself. I was thinking about, I want to provide for someone else. I want to actually provide for someone else. And I tell you that, I think it was the deadline, the overdue notice came. The pre- I'm like, I, I'm literally going to have to write him a letter and say, I'm really sorry um, for breaking this poor child's heart. I, I'm not able to complete the sponsorship and, and renew that. But, you know, after the second overdue notice, I was praying. And then, and then I got two, two phone calls. That I was, as I was about to cancel it, I got two phone calls in a day about a job offer and saying, Sam, I want you to start this job doing, you know, out-of-school hours care work. And I thought, oh, thank you. The first call comes in. I'm like, thank you, God, you've provided. But it was only like a few hours a week. And then the second call that very same day came in and saying, you know, Sam, we're desperate. 
we've got some, some of the same work. Could you start tomorrow? And I'm like, yes, I can start tomorrow. <laughs> All I've been doing is sitting here being poor. And, <laughs> and you know, so God providing that way. And I tell you, it wasn't just that. But when I got another email that week saying that, Sam, you have received a study grant because you come from the country and we are, there's going to be $2,000 come into your account next week. And just thinking, man, God knows what we need. When we, when, we give, when we give it to Him, when we entrust Him, even if we're on empty, then the provision is just around the corner. The provision is just around the corner. He knows what we need. He wants us to give our best, not just when we're left. You know, you know you just, I often think, God, why didn't you just do that earlier? <laughs> Have you ever thought that? And you think, I've been praying for years. Why is it, why is it now? Why are you answering the prayer now? You know? and, and I have these conversations with people all the time. I'm like, God, I would have loved this a long time ago. I mean, I'm ready. And, and, but I think that God brings his delays for that reason we talked about before, is that he wants us to trust. And some, there's only some ways that we can actually learn that trust. And, and I think about the story of Lazarus and how the, the delay that Jesus actually took his time to get there because he was, he was interested in bringing a provision and supplying the need, but he also wanted to, the trust to say, hey, no matter how long it takes, no matter where you're at, no matter how empty you are, I'm coming through for you. I have the provision that you need. And no matter how long it takes, I want you to trust me. I want you to have trusting hearts and open hands. The boy had, op- he had open hands with what he had, even the little he had, even though it made him empty, he had open hands and he had a trusting heart. God's calling us to the same thing. We need open hands and trusting hearts. You know, he, he received the, the boy's lunch. And he said this, bring, bring it here to me. And then he said, everyone to sit down on the grass, taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks. And he broke the loaves. And then he gave them to the disciples and the disciples gave them to the people. And then he gave to the disciples, this is really key, he gave to the disciples and then the disciples gave to the people. Did you know that you're God's delivery system? That the disciples, now Jesus is not, this is not an accident. Jesus doesn't do accidents. Specifically says that he's he's trying to teach the disciples a lesson. He's like, hey guys, I want you to know this. You know, it's my heart for the people. I care about all their life, including their hunger, including their physical needs. But I want you to have that same heart. I want you to have my heart for the people around you, not just for the spiritual, but for the practical. And he's saying, so he's like, he, I'm going to, he's saying, I've got this stuff, I've got this provision, but you're going to provide it. And he's actually put it in the hands of his disciples. And he's saying, you are in, you're in you are the ones who are going to steward it in this world. And that's the word for us. He's saying, hey, you know, young person, older person, person who's employed, person who's not employed. He's saying, you are God's delivery system. I have given you a provision, something that's not just for you. Yes, it is for you, because I'm sure the disciples ate and were full. But he's like, I've got something for you that I want you to give to someone else. I wonder, what's in your hand? What's God put in your hand that he's saying, hey, it's great for you to have it, but it's actually also for others. What's in your hand? What's in your hand? What are your talents? What are your gifts? What are your passions? What have you got a lot of? Have you got a lot of money? Have you got a lot of time? You know, when I was unemployed, I had a lot of time. And so I, I, would, I would catch up with as many people as I could, encourage them in God. But I tell you, you know, you, you might come into church on a Sunday and you might think, yeah, we're we talking about gifts, giving, you know, serving. That's all good stuff. But, and then you look on stage and you think, man, they're talented. And then you look at yourself, you know, I can't sing. <laughs> oh, you all can sing. Well done. Um, yeah, thanks. Thanks. You know, I'm, still, I'm on my own on that one. Um, but you can see what's happening in here. And there's limited opportunities on a Sunday. 
But I tell you what, even though there's limited opportunities, we still need people to serve on a Sunday. There's still plenty of opportunity. And, um, but we can get into that mindset of actually thinking, I don't have a place. There's not a place for me here. And we can look at our gifts and our talents and whatever. And we can think that's what it's all about. It's a Sunday. But you know, God has gifted you and what you have in your hands is not just for a Sunday. It's for the body. The gifts are for the body. We read about that um, in, in other places of the Bible, in 1 Corinthians, as it's talking about, you know, the gifts that God bestows upon us. And I'll tell you, you know, my dad, just take my dad, for example. My dad is not a preacher. My dad is definitely not a singer. In fact, he's terrible. Um, dad, if you're watching, I love you. Um, and, but, but I'll tell you what my dad can do, even though his ministry expression isn't primarily on a Sunday, My dad loves gardening, and he is good at it. Anything to do with outside uh, the the home, he is is amazing. And you know what he does? There's people in the church community and connected with the church community who don't have a lawnmower, who who they are physically disabled, and they can't can't do anything practically around the house. And without anyone asking, my dad finds out about this, and he will regularly, he has like a roster, and he will regularly go around to people's houses bring his tools, bring the trailer, he'll clean it up, he'll mow the lawns, he'll, plant, he'll bring plants, he'll put it in there, he'll make their gardens look beautiful. And he, he is giving what is in his hands. You know, it's not a formal ministry. It's not a formal ministry, but I tell you, maybe your ministry is not a formal ministry either. 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 I sound like such a bogan. <clears throat> Got no teeth. Um, but I tell you, what what has God put in your hand? What has God put in your hand? Because whatever He's put in your hand, you need to give it. Because there would have been no miracle if there wasn't the disciples who were bringing it. I, I tell you, what, what miracles God has in store, what su- answers of prayer to provision has He got in line for you and He's just waiting for you to come and bring it to someone. You don't know what people have prayed. You don't know what people are waiting for. And maybe you are the answer. God has given you something which is the answer to their prayer. What is in your hands? I tell you that there are so many stories, and you've got stories where you're sitting as well, about how the answer to the provision has come unexpectedly through a person. The provision often comes through God's people. And often that will happen. I'm just hearing about stories um, the last couple of weeks about how that happens through a life group and how God actually brings people into your life at the right moments who can give you what you need, but also so you can give them and build them up and encourage them. And uh, that's why we're putting such a push onto life groups. And this is your community where you're not just caring for each other spiritually, but you're actually caring for each other practically. And so to help me preach this message as we, um, as we uh, finish, wrap it up, I want to invite Tracy Bevan to come up and just to, just to share with us um, a story, a story, and Mike, um, just for m- muscular support, um, <laughs> and and just so Tracy, um, I don't have the question in front of me, but um, I want you. I'd love you to share a time when you've seen um, a small group or a life group um, actually be the answer to a practical need in someone's life. Yeah. Thank you, Sam. Oh, an awesome message. Um, I was talking to Michael about this week and it was like, wow, how do we even narrow that down? We've been life group leaders for a couple of weeks now. Um, and thanks, a couple, did I say a couple of weeks? Mm. Oh, a couple of years, sorry. <laughs> Gosh, sorry. <laughs> hey, um, and this morning, our, you know, our opening song, In My Father's House, There's a Place for Me. Um, for Michael and I, that's what life group's all about. We want everybody to know that there's a place for them um, in, in, within the body of Christ. Um, so we've had this um, real privilege of providing um, opportunity, sorry, providing support to people in really critical situations, which I won't go into today, but they've come from the relationships they have through our life group. So they're not going to come to church and go to the a pastor and say, oh, this has happened and that's happened, but they'll, they can come to us, they can reach out to somebody in our life group and say, this has happened. Um, and then through these relationships, um, people in our life group feel that they're safe to share um, within the group and then we can pray. And through um, 
these prayers in the last, particularly probably in the last 12 months. In our life group, we've had physical and emotional healings. We've had relationship restorations and breakthrough. We've had employment opportunities come through. And then on the practical level, we've been able to support families that, that just don't have that... Um, you know, extra social support that they need just to be able to get them to come to church and know that there's somebody here for them to help. Um, I had a chat with a couple of our life group members this week and they said for them it's so much about the social support. They used to feel really anxious coming to church on a Sunday because they didn't know anybody. And now that they know that they've got friends here, they've got safe people that they can come to on a Sunday and if they need to cry, they can cry. If they just want to sit and have a chat, they can. Um, and I know for me that's been really powerful as well. When, I'm, when I haven't had the best week, I can come and reach out of, to any of the guys in our life group. Um, and a theme that kept coming up was just that it provides a bridge between our church um, and, you know, else what happens on a Sunday and then what happens during the week. Because I think sometimes we can feel a bit disconnected. Um, it kind of, it gives that real cohesion between our, the whole of our life. Um, so there's not that fragmented kind of disconnected feeling. Um, and, you know, through all of this, this is building all of our faith and helping us to make Christ the centre of everything that we do. Awesome. That's awesome. <clears throat> and I tell you, you know, it is a commitment. And often to sign up and to commit to a group, whether it be for six weeks or for a year, it's actually you think, man, I don't have any time to give. I feel like I'm empty of time. <laughs> And, uh, and I often feel like that, but I'm, I tell you, when we actually step forward in faith, when we don't have all the answers and we just think, oh, I'm, I want to give, God. I don't, I'm not just wanting to think about what I can get. I want to give. And you t- t- just like in this story, as the boy gave, it wasn't until after he gave that the actual miraculous provision came. That's often when it comes. God asks for our trust, and then he will bring his provision. And I just love it that it says, it's just, it's just a great story. They all ate. This is how it ended. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. Man, I just love this. What an encouragement this is that, you know, whatever we give to God, He's not gonna leave us empty-handed. Even, even if we might feel empty for a time, He's not gonna leave us empty-handed. Even if we feel like we're running low, He's not going to leave us in that place. He's saying, if you entrust your life to me, if you entrust your gifts to me, I tell you, if you're generous with all that you have, I will pour out my blessing upon your life. Because if you're a person who's actually saying, you know, God, I entrust, I trust that you know what I need. I trust that, that I have all the supply resources. When you want to release it, I'll grab it. But until then, I'm going to trust you. And if we're going to be people who trust, we're going to be people who have that attitude, I tell you, God is going, He's just looking for people like that to pour out His blessing. Pour out His blessing. But it must be preceded by trust. It must be preceded. Why don't we stand together? Has the band come and join us on stage? You know, I wonder if God's waiting for that moment to pour out His provision. He's waiting for us to stop worrying about ourselves. This morning, I wonder, what are you worried about this morning? What are your needs? What are your needs that you have? Whether it be financial, whether it be relational, whether it be material, whether it be emotional, whether it be a matter of a physical need, God's saying, would you stop worrying and start trusting? Trusting hearts, trusting hearts. And I wonder if for the rest of us is thinking, man, you, God, you want us to have trusting hearts. You know what we need before we even ask, that we have a rich supply that we have access to through a loving, good and perfect Father. We can trust you. And he's saying, I want you to trust me and I also want you to have open hands. The things that I've given you, whether it be the possessions, the gifts, the finances, the relationships, the time, I don't want you to hold that for yourself. I want, just like this boy who came with open hands, who entrusted it to Jesus, entrusted it for the good of others. 
God's saying we need to have trusting hearts and open hands. What, what do you need to be? What's God, the, through the Holy Spirit, putting His finger on and just saying, you've been holding that too tightly. You've been holding that to yourself. Would you release it? Would you actually, you know, the thing is when we release, when we have open hands with what God gives us, things can come out of our hands. But what I find is that when we have open hands, God might take something away, but it also what happens is it leaves room for more. It leaves room for more. And so I'm, when I've got open hands, I'm like, God, I know that they're empty at the moment, but I know there's something even greater that you're going to put into my hands. And then I'm going, to, I'm going to steward that as well. And then, God, if you take that, I want you to put something else in. And whatever you put into my hand, then I'm going to use that for your glory as well. And God, I know that just like in this story, that whatever you take, whatever you get, I know that at the end of the day, there's going to be more than enough. More than enough. You know, in a moment, we're going to sing a song. Because God wants our hearts. But why don't we first pray together all across this place? And if you've, just as a sign of response to this message, if, if you've got an area where you're thinking, man, I need to have my hands open with all that God's given me again, just to open your hands out. I encourage everyone just to open your hands out in front of you and say, as a sign to say, God, you can have it. God, I come with, with open hands and a trusting heart. God, I know that, that you call me. I don't have to worry about my life, what I shall eat, what I shall drink, what I shall wear. That just like the birds of the air, they do not sow or reap or store away in barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. You will feed us, Lord. We trust you. And do not worry about your clothes. See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. And if this is how God clothes the grass, grass of the field, which is here today and gone tomorrow, how much more, how much more will he clothe you? How much more will he give to you as you give it to him? Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Let's just sing this song together.